All right. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Vardim for, for this opportunity. Um, make sure I can move this. Yeah, my lab works a little bit on the chromatin structure, but I don't feel like uh, that's our, our expertise. So instead, today I'd like to actually share with you something uh, related to chromatin regulation. Uh, so our work actually on the RNA modification side. And you know, many years ago, we proposed this idea that uh, some of these RNA modifications might regulate gene expression in ways analogous to uh, DNA histone modifications. And in fact, we were, um, that was many years ago, we were working on DNA demethylation and we, we wondered some of these DNA damage repair enzymes could actually reverse RNA methylation. And that actually led to a discovery of a RNA demethylase. The reason I want to use this as an introduction slide, as you can see in a few million, uh, we'll come back to this because back then we discovered this as the messenger RNA um, uh, M6A demethylase. Um, and turns out it also works on the chromatin and regulates chromatin structure. So back then the substrate we, we discovered for this reversible um, methylation our N6 methyl adenosine, and it was actually well known to occur on mammalian messenger RNA. Uh, it was discovered back in 1970s. Um, it's essential uh, for most of the human systems. And um, if you calculate, it's about three for messenger RNA. So um, there's a writer component. Uh, people know for several decades, uh, we came in and showed uh, the process is reversible, at least on the messenger RNA side. And also uh, we show the methyl transferase when others are, are, are actually very big, 1000 KD. So to my knowledge, it might be the biggest in any DNA or, or histone modification systems. And on the messenger RNA side, I'm just going to give you a few slides before I transition to chromatin state. And we and others spent almost 10 years uh, map out the detailed pathways, uh, how this modification would affect the uh, post-transcriptional regulation. There, there are these reader proteins that recognize hundreds of methylated messenger RNA and they were affected the decay. Uh, some of those were actually stabilized and, and others were, were, were mediated translation regulation. Um, the sort of future of these uh, the RNA methylations is the modification is essential uh, to most the cell differentiation development. Uh, if you knock out the methyl transferase in embryonic stem cells, uh, the embryonic stem cells stuck at a very early stage, right? Mouse died at an early embryo stage, but the stem cells were stopped uh, differentiation. Um, that's probably the case. That's actually turned out to be the case in many, many cellular systems, pro T cells, naive T cells, pro B cells, neurogenesis, it doesn't matter what systems you, you work on, the methylation is essential uh, or critical to cell differentiation. Now, one sort of, uh, just to give you one example, the, the, the reader proteins of ITHDF2 mediate decay of these messenger RNAs. And, and we previously suggested that what they uh, really does is uh, mediate this transcriptome switch. So whenever you have a cell, you want to di differentiate to the next stage, you have the clear transcripts that dictates the previous cell state. And that's actually goes through the methylation and, and sort of uh, coordinated decay of these transcripts. And the examples are, if you look at maternal to zygotic transition, neurogenesis, or even look at the uh, stem cell expansion. If you get rid of YGDF2, you, you impair the cell state transition and you can uh, dramatically expand the uh, hematopoietic stem cell in this case, but also other stem cell systems. So we had a lot of fun and you know the field's been moving forward. This has been um, <clears throat> recognized as one of the key <laughs> mechanisms or pathways uh, to regulate MRA stability. In 2008, we started to realize if you knock out the methyl transferase, the phenotype is turned to be a lot more severe than you knock out the individual of these writer, uh, reader proteins that recognize the methylated RNA. We also started to realize that uh, some of these methylations, if you, if you sequence the whole sort of RNA, and you realize that some of this methylation seems to occur on non-coding RNAs, and they actually align well with these promoter-associated RNAs, enhancer RNAs, or either or even the ritual transposon RNAs. So we wonder, in addition to a post transcriptional regulation, whether some of this methylation actually regulates transcription, or um, further, maybe they can uh, somehow factor the chromatin state. 
the first experiment we did, we actually uh, directly asked the uh, Howard Chang for this uh, uh, mouse embryonic stem cell, which he made with depletion of uh, METT03. This is the key writer component. And later on, we made our own. And we did a few very simple experiments. Immediately, we realized that if you look at the EU labeling, the, the total nascent RNA output increased quite dramatic. If you perform a tunnel analysis, you can clearly see the chromatin become more open uh, in this uh, uh, when you deplete uh, METT03. You can complement with a Y-type methyltransferase, but not an inactive mute. So what's going on? Uh, we quickly move to sequencing. We can isolate the chromatin fraction, obtain all the RNAs, deplete the ribosome RNA, and the sequence M6A methylated RNA. What we realize is, of course, uh, we saw depletion of uh, methylation on messenger RNA or pre-messenger RNA, but we also see depletion of these uh, methylations on enhancer, promoter, repeat RNA. Interestingly, without methylation, these RNAs show higher level on the chromatin, all right? So their levels on chromatin increases. Somehow the methylation suppress or reduce the level of this RNA on the chromatin. We turned on to another nuclear reader. This one is also essential, um, actually very, very important to knock out in mouse embryonic stem cells. It's even that has shown some defect, a mouse died at the very early uh, stage if you get rid of YTTC1. We observed a very similar thing. We can see um, more nascent RNA production when you get rid of YTTC1. You can rescue with the Y type, but not a mutant that would not bind methylated RNA. And this is consistent with tunnel analysis. So. At least the, the simple hypothesis, uh, some of this chromatin RNA can be methylated. And a portion of those might be recognized by this reader protein, which actually we know previously is adapter for a nuclear exosome complex that would decay RNA, right? So that leads to decay. And perhaps that affects um, um, nuclear or the chromatin state. So you can knock out the YTGDC1 and perform a uh, sequencing of chromatin RNA. And in this time, um, you see a little bit of change on enhancer promoter RNA, but majorly you see this repeat RNA. Uh, you really accumulate this repeat RNA when you get rid of YTGDC1. The major types of these repeat RNAs are line RNAs, ERV, and other ritual transposon RNAs. Um, in fact, if you follow the Normal decay, this is the normal decay of the line uh, RNA, you can see this, but if you knock out methyl transferase or you knock out YTGDC1, you delay the decay of this on the chromatin, okay? So essentially you have this mechanism, you can methylate uh, the RNA and uh, particularly the racial transpose RNAs uh, can be decayed through YTGDC1. What's the biological consequences? How is this related to um, the chromatin state a change we just observed. It turns out if you perform sequencing, there's something like a 6,000 uh, genes that have upstream methylation or methylations occur to the introns, the ritual transposons. And if you get rid of M6A, 99% chance you see increase the transcription rate of this downstream transcripts, right? Nice uh, 6,000 transcripts, that's a major, effect. If you look at the chromatin um, uh, state or look at uh, histone mark, uh, marks, uh, if you get rid of methyl transferase, you accumulate K4 trimethyl, K27 in acetylation. And if you just perform chip seq experiments, look at the start, uh, transcription starting site. If you get rid of methyl transferase at this 6,000 genes, you always see increased uh, K4 trimethyl, K27 acetylation, indicating a more open local chromatin state, right? So not just the globally you see this, but then uh, these methylations indeed appear to regulate downstream gene transcription and the chromatin state. What's going on? Well, um, I don't need to show these papers why we always saw these RNAs are spaghetti. They probably are, but they're quite important in whatever condensate formations discussed today or to me, a symbol of transcription active complexes, right? And they're there to help assemble transcription active complexes. And uh, we believe um, the way to regulate this process is probably through modification, right? There are several ways to regulate this. For ritual transposon RNAs that help regulate the nearby 
uh, transcription, you can methylate and decay that piece of RNA. And later on, other labs show that the presence of the methylation is critical to recruit uh, histone modifiers to install stuff like K9 trimethyl. Right? And that way uh, at least to repress the um, uh, chromatin state. Now, everything is, is, is correlation at this moment, right? Um, what about the causal relationship, right? Um, to answer that question, uh, we quickly um, put together a, a small CRISPR system. This is the RNA targeting DCAS13 in active CRISPR. We fuse to a demethylase, so we can perform site-specific demethylase. So we pick the 10 loci, and here's the one. There's just one example. We delivered this specifically to each methylation site. Here's the super enhancer RNA. There's some methylation. If you, re, uh, uh, if you knock out the methyl transferase, you see the methylation is pretty much gone. And you, you look at the K27 acetylation, you see a dramatic increase, right? So uh, the methylation correlated with low K27 acetylation. Depletion is to higher K27 acetylation and more uh, or higher transcription rate downstream. If we deliver this towards that particular uh, methylation size, we can uh, reduce methylation on that enhancer RNA. We increase the half-life time of that enhancer RNA and we increase transcri transcription rate, K K4 trimethyl, K27 acetylation. So we did this to 10 different loci, at least the nine loci showed consistent results. So with that, we pretty much established this new layer of regulation. We believe um, uh, there's this methylation occurring on non-coding RNAs, um, and that appears to play quite important roles. And, uh, and you're gonna say this is, a, uh, is the part of the story. A year later, three labs um, independently made a very similar discoveries and two labs showed uh, some of the really nice pictures or videos, images this morning. There are actually two labs showed that the methylation is essential to reestablish ketochromatin during mitosis. There's some really nice um, um, uh, slides that they showed, right? Uh, some of the ketochromatin is gone and the transcription occurs. We don't know that's a barren transcription or, or transcription related to regulation. Once you have transcripts there, they need to be methylated to recruit um, proteins reestablish K9 trimethyl. If you don't have methylation, you can't reestablish ketochromatin in those regimes uh, after mitosis. Right? Uh, so I encourage you to read these papers. All right. So unfortunately, when we talk about chromatin state, we can't just talk about DNA modification, histone modification. So uh, we somehow unfortunately add this another layer of complexity on these non-coding RNAs. And I showed you the writers, the readers, right? Um, we have methyl transferase that seems to mediate methylation, right? And then the, the readers that comes in uh, seems to affect the decay or recruit histone modifiers. But DC1 only works on ritual transpose on RNA, right? I showed you uh, there's enhancers, promoters, right? They can be just the one reader protein. Right, mediate this, this regulation. So naturally, we went ahead and look at the ENCO data, or we look at the uh, uh, RNA uh, binding protein creep seq data correlated with uh, chromatin RNA M6A sequencing. And we look for overlap of, of uh, RNA binding versus uh, M6A uh, sites. And a few proteins show up. Uh, RBM15 is actually a component of methyl transferase. K36 trimethyl is well known to recruit the methyl transferase. Uh, for, uh, to facilitate the messenger RNA methylation and the port 2 obviously port 2 uh, is important. And then we have RBM22 and RBFOX2. So we gave our friends RBM22 to work on, we decided to focus on RBFOX2 because this is actually interesting splicing regulators has an interesting um, conserved motif. The, the bizarre part of this is that um, it has a phenotype quite dramatic phenotype, but this phenotype is not related to the splicing defect. People know that, right? Uh, it's a well-known splicing factor. As to my mind, lots of nuclear RNA binding proteins being labeled as splicing factors, probably right so, but many of those probably have additional functions. This is the one. And it shows good overlap uh, with, with M6A. And uh, very interestingly, this thing has two distribution profiles. Uh, Within genes, indeed, it's close to uh, the exon uh, intron splicing 
uh, regimes is there to regulate the splicing, but a, a portion of this locates to the promoter sites. All right, it's not uh, within the it, it doesn't touch implants. It's really at the promoter sites. Now, if you zoom in into the promoter sites, the overlap with M6A extremely well, right? And then when we uh, use a methylated pro pro probe perform a pull down, we enrich this protein, and we pull down the protein with this bonding RNA, and we enrich M6A, and we can sequence that RNA. We obtain the exact methylation motif, right, under uh, the protein binding sequence, and we use that motif. Uh, we methylated without methylation, we perform pull down again, we can enrich RBFOX2. So all these results indicate it binds promoter RNA and selectively binds methylated ones or preferentially binds, I should say. It's a lot of sequence experiments you can ignore. Uh, I just want to show you that uh, the depletion caused the hypomethylation, uh, open chromatin, gene activation, and all this occurs with RBFOX2 and M6A. If you have RBFOX2 and M6A there, you see the major effect, right? Now, the increase of K, uh, K4 trimethyl, it's a suppressor, right? If you get rid of it, at the M6A side, you see the most open chromatin state. And also it interacts with one of the component of methyl transferase RBM15. And only when you have both RBFOX2 and RBM15 binding, you see again, the most dramatic effect on M6A. Mechanistically, we did a lot of experiments and, and previously people thought RBFOX2 directly binds PRC2. And what we showed is actually RBFOX2 most likely binds YTHDC1. And then uh, remember it's the same YTHDC1 and this YTHDC1 recruits PRC2 uh, to add a suppressive uh, sort of marks, right? So this is the way we believe almost like a transitional factor, but it doesn't bind DNA. Instead it binds that methylated RNA uh, to mediate nearby um, um, K27 trimethylation to facilitate the suppression of gene expression. What's the biological consequences? RBFOX2, if you look at a hematopoietic stem cell differentiation, the level comes down. It seems to suppress um, hematopoietic stem cell differentiation. And that's indeed the case in collaboration with Professor Jianjun Chen at City of Hope. Uh, we, we, we knock down RBFOX2 in a variety of different systems. So you can see that leads to, that seems to drive uh, differentiation in this myeloid system. And in leukemia, if you, if you drive differentiation, obviously the first thing you think about is the leukemia systems. This is a, a well-established systems. So we, when we knock down RBFOX2, uh, we seems to promote leukemia differentiation, which seems to uh, re, um, prolong survival of the mouse. I don't think this has any therapeutic uh, impact at this moment, but it's actually interesting to see uh, this is one system and we're actually just uh, obtained the second system uh, in a very different, it's not even a blood system, we found RBFOX2 really regulates stem cell differentiation. In that system, there might be therapeutic potential. Mechanistically, I, I personally believe this is all these are group effect, but you know, whenever you write a paper, a reviewer wants to say one gene. Uh, so we say, okay, here's a TGF data, everybody love, right? Uh, this one has a promoter M6A right there, and it's actually bound by RBM15. When we perturb RBFOX2, we can see M6A change and we can see um, um, PRC2 binding difference. And, and I believe we even delivered a demethylase specifically to that side and then we can show we, we change TGF beta binding. So at least uh, in one cases, uh, this system seems to uh, suppress uh, TGF bar uh, beta um, in, in, through M6A, um, uh, through this uh, chromatin M6A mediated regulation. All right, um, so I think of what I showed you is one reader that touches upon the ritual transposon. And now we have another reader, uh, which seems to bind promoter RNA. And I fully anticipated the additional proteins uh, that may work as transgenal factor, but instead they bind methylated RNA. I want to finish um, with, with, with my last story about the erasers. I told you the writers, uh, the readers, um, all the M6A binding proteins, um, but also on the process that can reverse this on the chromatin. 
This goes back to the introduction. The first protein that got us into this field is this FTO, which mediates demethylation of M6A. Uh, we did this in many cancer cells in early days. Uh, you oxidize, oxidize the methyl and, and remove the methyl group. And this is the inhaler cells. Um, if you isolate the messenger RNA, uh, if you get rid of uh, FTO, you see about 15, 20% increase of uh, methylation on messenger RNA. In leukemia, 40% of total methylation on messenger RNA could be reversed by FTO. Right? The phenotype of FTO is kind of bizarre. It leads to late embryo deaths, right? And if you look at the human or mouse tissues, except uh, deposites and neurons, in many other tissues it does not seem to touch in messenger RNA. Uh, there are studies by us, by others, the correlation studies, it's there, but it doesn't seem to work on messenger RNA, except in deposites and, and in neurons. In neurons, it really work on messenger RNA, right? So what's going on, right? This puzzled us for a decade. Um, we didn't have a, have an answer until after we realized that the muscle transfer is not only in store messenger RNA methylation, but it also installs this chromatin RNA uh, methylation. We call them chromatin associated regulatory RNA now, so to be different from coding uh, transcripts. And we wonder if the FTO doesn't work on messenger RNA, maybe, maybe it work on these chromatin RNA. So very quickly, we constructed the uh, FTO knockout of mouse embryonic stem cell. And when we isolated the messenger RNA and look at their methylation, we didn't see much. There's a tiny bit of increase when we knock out the FTO. So they probably work on some messenger RNA. But if we took a chromatin RNA, deplete the ribosome RNA, you'll see a very nice increase, about 10, 15% increase of total methylation. Um, the postdoc was very encouraged, went ahead to perform the sequencing. And indeed, um, what he found was line and herb, the ritual transposon RNAs are the major substrates. Uh, when you get rid of FTO, you see M6A accumulation on these um, ritual transposon RNAs, in particular line one. I'm going to just use line one because it's the major one. The presence of methylation leads to reduce the level of these guys on the chromatin. You know this very well. Um, it was 400,000 or 500,000 copies of line one, they're young ones, right? They're the recent ones, active young ones. Those are the ones mostly affected by FTO. To confirm this, we did a bunch of experiments. We isolated the line one and look at the M6A and the level. Clearly, if we get rid of FTO, we see increased M6A on line one and reduce the line one level. When we put on FTO, we enrich line one. And we also apply the small molecule inhibitor of FTO to show this is activity dependent, right? And lastly, we can block line one with ASO and compare with FTO knockout the the expression profiles quite similar, right? Uh, all indicating the, uh, um, the main pathway of FTO is probably goes through line one regulation. On the chromatin state, if we deplete the FTO, we accumulate M6A, you can clearly see that we, we, we drive a close the chromatin, globally close the chromatin. If we deliver a CRISPR system um, with FTO targeting line one, we can partially rescue that. So we, we did a fun experiment. We add FTO inhibitor into mouse embryonic stem cell Y type and we follow the kinetics. And you can see the buildup of M6A on line one that leads to reduce the uh, line one level and you can see reduce the chromatin state, right? Um, um, quite a nice correlation. So all this suggests um, what we have is probably a cis regulation. Uh, these line RNAs are M6A methylated and FTO somehow can constantly remove some of this M6A to maintain transcription active state. But if you get rid of FTO, these M6As will recruit by 2 dc one these to uh, repress the chromatin state. Mechanistically, I'm not going to uh, say too much. That turns out to be 10 supporting figures <laughs> in the paper, um, just like everybody else. Um, but uh, I don't know. I. I can't say I fully understand this. This is just observation. We don't quite understand what's going on. What we observe is that 
There are lots of line ones. There are line ones outside of the genes, line ones within the genes. Line ones within the genes give us the major effect. About 1,400 genes actually don't know this in mouse embryonic stem cell with line one either in introns or antisense. These are the ones affected the most by FTO, right? If you have M6A, it either leads to decay or recruitment of set db one Here's the results. If you compare this line one containing genes versus the rest, if you knock out FTO, you get the most down regulation, right? So there's some local effect and really change the chromatin state through RNA methylation. Functionally, I, probably everybody knows the importance of LAN1, I assume, right? If you block LAN1 with the ASO, your two cells will not be able to propagate to, to the four cells, right? It's that important. And if you take a mouse ESL, you can differentiate that the LAN1 level goes up six folds, FTO level goes up three folds. You get rid of FTO, LAN1 level can only go up three folds. And that leads to increase the differentiation, reduce the proliferation. And we can actually rescue this about 60% if we deliver FTO specific to line one. So uh, line one play important role, but there are probably other ritual transposon RAs play um, similar roles, not as important perhaps as line one. If you look at the mouse early embryo, we did this through collaboration with my former coworker and, and um, her previous uh, PhD advisor. Um, so if you look at the early embryo, if you knock out FTO, you see exact same set of genes show change. And these are same genes we discover in mouse ESL. They have line ones within genes and they similarly displayed a reduced transcription. And if we deliver this CRISPR system into early mouse embryos, we can rescue gene expression. I spent all this time uh, showing you, I uh, hope I convinced you, um, we do have a reversal process on the chromatin RNA and that seems to um, 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 have an important impact on the chromatin regulation. Now, if you look at the mammalian tissue, this is actually a very gratifying correlation we previously could not see. If I look at the FTO level versus total messenger RNA M6A level in all tissues, I did not see a correlation that bothered me for many years. But now if I just take a line one, I, took, I only look at the line one RNA total cell, I see a very nice correlation. The tissues with high FTO tend to have low M6A on line one, a high line one RNA level, very nice. So this again confirmed that line is Line one is the substrate. If I look at the second demethylase discovered by my lab, this is the messenger RNA uh, demethylase RP5. You see a nice correlation with total messenger RNA methylation, but you don't see this on line one. Lastly, FTO is highly expressed in heart and the brain. So we made a cerebellum specific knockout. We can uh, clearly see increased M6A on line one, reduced the line one level, et cetera, et cetera, collaborators working on the physiological importance of this, this regulation. So um, what I showed you um, during pandemics, all right, uh, we were able to actually map out this additional layer of regulation on the chromatin. This is a con uh, completely, well, not completely, this is a mediated through RNA, but actually lots of these are going through the histone modifications, right? RNA as a way to either decay that RNA or recruit histo modifiers. And we have writers, uh, readers, but also erasers uh, in this whole uh, spectrum. Um, because I still have probably five million, so I, I share with you uh, some, some fun stuff. All right. um, so we didn't start to manipulate this. We had a lot of fun uh, manipulating in mouse. Uh, we can actually grow mouse bigger or smaller, depending on what you want. We have more mice, pops or less, et cetera, et cetera. And my, my former postdoc had a much better idea. And she decided to put a human or mouse FTO into, into plants. I, I thought this would never work, but actually worked. And if we put into rice, we of course tried many plants and rice gave the most romantic phenotype. You see the e expanded root compared to the Y type. And in greenhouse, we saw threefold increase of biomass and the yield. Right, the best the people have ever done in the past is about 20, 30% with heterosis, hybridization, right? We can do threefold in um, greenhouse. 
In real fields under two different climate conditions, uh, we achieved the 50% increase. These rice with longer roots are more drought resistant and resistant to other, other stresses. We were bothered by mechanisms for years until we worked on mouse embryonic stem cell and we learned what we learned there. We come back thinking, ah, we know what's going on. Previously, we thought the messenger RNA, we could not explain this phenotype until when we look at the chromatin state, we're like, okay, when we overexpress FQ, we really opened up the chromatin state. The entire transcription was uplifted, all right? Uh, so it's really a way somehow open the chromatin state and that somehow leads to a lot more cell proliferation at the root system. This is something I don't understand, and but that's what's going on. And that drive the root development, right? Also drives more tillers, so you have more branches, right? So if you have a longer root, the plant biology will tell you that's exactly what they want, right? That will sig signal to grow. If you have more branches, it will lead to more biomass. Um, so I actually had the rice today. Maybe some of you guys had a potato. Uh, so here's your potato, right? Uh, so see, there's um, out of eight or nine plants, um, five to six, we see this dramatic effect. There's a couple, uh, we're still trying to understand what's going on. Uh, what I want to say is that we're not adding something. We're adding a demethylase to remove a endogenously existing modification, right? So this regulation is intrinsic to the plant. Uh, we just help remove it. And this type of a chromatin regulation, the phenotype we've not seen with other systems so far in plants, at least, right? Uh, with that, um, I just want to close by saying that so far we've been working on M6A and uh, the lab has been uh, spreading to these other modifications, pseudoiridine, very interesting, M5C, 2'0 methyl, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on messenger RNA and some of those things uh, seems to also occur on, on chromatin RNA. Um, so we're, we're excited and hopefully next time uh, we'll have more stories. Um, I, I called the names. Uh, I just want to thank my, my collaborators and, and conflict of interest and be happy to take questions later on here. Thank you. <laughs>